Hello and behind me is a space shuttle orbiter which was designed to carry both humans and cargo into space and then glide back down to earth and in this video I'm going to take you on a detailed tour. First I'm going to walk around this one pointing out what makes it unique and interesting and then I'm going to find a trainer and show you what it was like inside. I make videos about planes. This includes trip reports on board flights from around the world and I also make detailed tours crawling through significant aircraft in museums. I'm also on Instagram and Facebook. The first thing to mention is that the term space shuttle actually includes everything you can see now. There's two solid rocket boosters and an external fuel tank. What we'll look at today is called the orbital vehicle and this one is called Discovery and was the third of only five ever made. There were over 27,000 silica tiles to protect it from the incredible heat on re-entry but you'll notice that the hottest areas such as on the nose cone which could exceed 1600 degrees celsius are protected by a composite material consisting of carbon fiber reinforced in a matrix of graphite. The next level of heat insulation was called high temperature reusable surface insulation tiles and and this is what we're looking at now. These were made out of pure silica glass fibers and looking at the landing gear you can see just how thick the heat insulation was. They would absorb heat incredibly slowly. While the outside of these tiles might be 1200 degrees celsius on re-entry, the aluminium under it will be kept to around 148 degrees celsius. The next problem was that the silica didn't expand with temperature changes but the aluminium did so they couldn't be stuck to each other. They ended up using a felt layer between the two and some glue. As you can see, the surface looks pretty rough and that's because every tile could be inspected after a flight but only be replaced if it was needed. You can spot the new ones because they are a pristine black colour. If you zoom in on the tiles, there are written details explaining where each one belongs. That circular thing is not a screw as they were glued in place but rather a hole where after the flight, waterproofing liquid would be squirted into it to protect the surface from the rain and elements. And this was the Forward Reaction Control System or the RCS which includes these holes with thrusters inside of them that can fire and change the vehicle's orientation in space. There's even more at the rear which work in tandem with these. And directly behind that is the crew compartment which we'll explore soon. And that circular door is the main entry hatch and directly behind the crew compartment which really isn't very large is the payload bay and from here you can just make out the large doors that would open up. Now inside the payload bay is the shuttle remote manipulator system or the Canada arm. This was controlled from the back of the flight deck and used to move the objects around. These included the Hubble telescope and components for the International Space Station. The wing is a delta shape swept at an angle of 81 degrees at the inner leading edge and 45 degrees at the outer leading edges. It's designed for high speed stability. Remember that the orbiter can hit 17,500 miles per hour on re-entry but it's essentially just gliding down as it has no ability to go around and try to land again as the main engines are already turned off and the wings wouldn't generate a lot of lift. You'll notice that the thermal protection covering it is different on the wing's leading edge and is the highest thermal protection reinforced carbon carbon which is the same as the nose cone. There were four elevons on the trailing edges of the wings and while these did do nothing in orbit they were vital controls for the landing. At the top is the vertical stabilizer with a rudder providing your control while coming into land. It also acted as a speed brake by splitting and deflecting out on both sides at the same time and there was also a parachute to help with the braking. These two smaller rockets are the OMS or the Orbital Maneuvering System and they help push up the rocket into orbit as well as slowing it down as the whole vehicle actually moves backwards once it's in space. Obviously the unaerodynamic shape isn't an issue as space is just a vacuum. OMS is activated thus slowing it down and then gravity starts the re-entry process. These have their own separate propellant supply with tanks behind them in this bulging area. There's also more smaller RCS thrusters that you can see here too. Below that is the umbilical panel. They would be attached to the launch tower until just before the solid booster ignition. This connection includes power and communication as well as this is how fuel was pumped on board and into the large main fuel tank attached behind the orbiter just before launch. These are the three RS-25 main engines which are powered by liquid oxygen and liquid hydrogen. Fuel is stored in that orange tank which by the way only provides for the orbiter as the two white rockets on the sides have their own propellant inside of those. The fuel is fed back into the orbiter via pipes that you can see here in this model and I'll show you underneath shortly. 
The engines could be swiveled 10.5 degrees vertically and 8.5 degrees horizontally. So it was these that steered the entire space shuttle as well as provided rocket thrust towards orbit. These nozzles would get very hot so they move fuel which is stored well below zero degrees through these pipes that you can see over it and provide it cooling before returning to the combustion chamber and then ignited itself. Once in orbit, the main engines are turned off and are not used until the next flight. As we walk underneath, you'll see this extension of the tiles which is an adjustable flap, and this was there to protect the rocket engines from the extreme heat of re-entry. Under these hatches is where it attached to the orange fuel tank, and there's another one further forward near the nose here. Now they fill the main tank via the orbiter, so they've got hydrogen coming out of here on the left and oxygen on the right. Once the tanks have been released, these hatches close and remain so until they're back on Earth. Now they lose around 150 tiles per mission, and they're more vulnerable around these hatches. You can see the black tiles, which means that they're newer. They're in a herringbone pattern, with the idea being that if a tile was ripped off further aft, it may not create a weak point moving directly at the same angle as the wind. There were three sets of landing gear through the doors in the heat shields. They could only be deployed once and not retracted as to save weight, but because any premature extension would be catastrophic due to the gaping holes in the heat shield, they could only be lowered by manual controls. Because it was gliding down with no ability to abort a landing, the gears had to deploy reliably. There was a triple redundant hydraulic system to lower them, and if they all failed, then there were pyrotechnic charges in place to cut the lock hooks and lower the gear, if everything else failed. Underneath the payload bay were three hydrogen oxygen fuel cells, which generated electricity for the vehicle, and their byproduct was water, which could then be consumed by the crew. You'll notice the different colored skin on the lateral aspects of the fuselage, and doors are covered in a white low density fibrous silica batting material which has a quilt like appearance and this replaced tiles on later missions as it was far easier to maintain. There were six windows at the front and they had three layers. The silica fused outer layer was designed to be resistant to heat while the inner layer was alumino silicate and designed to withhold the cabin pressure in the vacuum of space and then the middle layer of glass did a combination of both. Now here we are entering the full scale replica orbiter called Independence on display at the Houston Space Center. Roughly this is where we're entering, which would be directly into the cargo bay, and then we'll turn right through a wall and then into the mid deck. The orange suit is the launch and entry suit, also known as the pumpkin suit. It was a partial pressure suit and provided the crew with oxygen, a parachute, a light raft, drinking water, flotation devices, uh, radio beacons, flares, and sea dye. Otherwise, they would just be wearing comfy clothes inside the orbiter. This here is a sleeping bag. Remember that there's no gravity, so you could sleep in any orientation. They would attach it to a wall so that you wouldn't be floating around the cabin while sleeping and potentially bumping into things. These are all lockers used for both personal items and experiment equipment and mission supplies. This here is the galley where the delicious meals were created, so rehydrated and then warmed. Here's the round entry and exit hatch, which we saw earlier and immediately welcoming visitors is the bathroom. They also use wet wipes to shower themselves in here. Now you'd be sitting here and then use these levers to swing around and lock in your legs. Larger deposits went, well, where you'd expect them and there was a tube that you could attach for the liquid variety of uh, deposits. This here is the ladder going up to the flight deck, which you could climb when you're on Earth or float up once you were in orbit. Behind that is the airlock, with room for up to two fully suited astronauts. This is what they would use to enter the payload bay and potentially out into space and work on and repair equipment. And here we are entering the payload bay itself, and remember that it looks a little smaller here because that they've added the access pathway for tourists such as myself. It's 18 meters long and 4.6 meters wide. Now the roof looks like a mirror, as they would actually open this up once they're in orbit and use it to reflect heat. Remember that there's no atmosphere to absorb the sun's radiation, so it got very hot in direct sunlight and also very cold in the shade. And here's the Canada arm, which you saw earlier. And finally, here's the flight deck, which will go back outside, up some stairs, and then check that out. Just so that you can orientate yourself, here's my view walking inside and turning right, you'll see the flight deck. 
Just to give you an idea of how small the cabin was, the back wall was joined to here, so you'd only have a few metres of wriggle room for a mission that could last for 10 to 13 days. On the right hand seat would be the pilot, and next to them would be the commander on the left. There would be two more seats behind them and where I'm currently standing, and a hatch down to the mid deck where we were a moment ago. It's not included here, but immediately behind was the aft flight station, and here's a mock up at the Pima Air and Space Museum. You can see the two seats set up here, and behind them were two windows used for looking into the payload bay with a joystick for the Canada arm. Now if you can imagine the aft station disappearing, then this would be your view again as we're back in Houston and walking back into the payload bay. I hope you enjoyed the video and coming up soon will be a tour through the shuttle carrier aircraft which is the 747-100 that you can see here in Houston. In the meantime, please check out my channel for many more similar videos and subscribe so that you're notified when my next one is out. Thanks for watching.